Good afternoon. I just want to talk really quickly about what's happening with the recruiting crisis. I'm sure people have heard. I'm just going to comment on the Army because that's my area of expertise, but I know it's going all around. They're having a real tough time getting young people of the 30% or so of the country that is actually eligible to enlist. Not very many of them are actually even asking about it. Now, the Army is slashing thousands of troops of posts in a major revamp to prepare for future wars. So they say they're getting rid of 24,000 slots now, they're saying this to prepare for future wars, but that's not logical because why did they have the slots in the first place? And we all know the recruiting is bad. So all of a sudden, oh, no, it's, it's to prepare for uh, future wars, to revamp. Yeah. Well, if only they were revamping and they weren't actually talking about wars, we are in no position to fight or maybe really shouldn't be trying to fight at all. That'd be one thing. But the real reason is the volunteer military is not attracting the kinds of, I'm going to say it, men that need to actually do this job. And I'm gonna reflect back here on this video with Terrence Pop. He's a 30 some odd year veteran of the US military, mostly in special forces and some civil affairs units. He and another NCO and two former lieutenant colonels are uh, talking about how things have changed drastically. Uh, and some of the things I heard just really made me want to pass out. Dudes in the room, two colonels and two old NCOs talking about the way it used to be in the military and how it is now in the military and just how far our military has truly fallen. A lot of the stuff you see with the trannies and all of that uh, in the military today was absolutely unthinkable in our era. He's right. This is stuff we used to joke about when we were you know, young E4s in the mid to late 90s. Oh, and the level of disrespect and the level of lack of attention to detail, the lack of duty and discipline that is in this military was unthinkable in our era. Absolutely unthinkable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's fun. And it's been going that way for a while. First noticed it when uh, after between 1991 to 1994, Bill Clinton, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, could sense things were kind of slipping away. Anyway, the things, like I said, the things that we thought were bad uh, seem old-fashioned these days. Look at This is... All right, let, let me uh, let me correct. Well, this. Sir and Pop, you got a uh, you've been here on Bragg and Fort Bragg is now Fort Liberty. That's another thing. They changed the names of all these posts because of political reasons, and now older veterans can't even talk about their memories to someone who's asking about possibly joining because the names don't match up and the experience isn't going to be something they can really relate to. So that's another rift. The standards here have dropped. Oh, I, I mean, I, Bragg used to be like Standardsville. We hated yeah. that place because they were all 670-1. He's referring to the regulation about correcting uniforms, which, again, seems like a small matter. It's not a small matter. Correcting uniforms, wearing things properly, saluting, all this stuff is building small elements of discipline at the lower levels so that later on you'll have it when you need it in combat, especially as a leader. You can't expect this stuff to materialize. It just doesn't. The, all the time. Yeah. Not, it's not like that anymore. Now, uh, they don't suit officers. What? <laughs> that, that's, well, that's a typical thing. Uh, they don't address sergeant majors. They don't wear their uniforms properly. Hands in the pockets, unbloused boots. That's a normal thing. I've been taking pictures, going to the PX, watching soldiers go in without covers. <laughs> with their All this stuff sounds minor, but you know, not saluting an officer. I made that mistake one time, and it was only because the officer walking past me was wearing his subdued rank on his coat, and I couldn't see it. So I, my apologies, sir, saluted him, carried on. But the idea of just regularly not saluting officers is really, really, really bad in terms of discipline and leadership and everything else, and no one sees this unless they're actually there. And it sounds like guys like this are some of the few who recognized it, and they're all retired. Their boots on bloused without their tops on. Right. Yeah, no, no. I, I could. And I used to correct them every time I walked to the library. Oh, I'm like, is this a no salute zone? Because I've, I've never got saluted. And none of these other officers have. One time I'm walking with my major and he tore into these guys at a defect. Right. But most most wouldn't do it. They just walk by. And, and these officers, uh, I have to be careful of how I judge them because I think they just gave up on this stuff. It's not that they're bad people, but they get no support. You, you correct the soldier now for not saluting or correcting their uniform. Or there's the demoralization against the demoralization. Yeah, if, if you try to correct a soldier and he rolls his eyes at you and you try to bring him up for disrespect and the commander doesn't back you up, well, then you look like an even bigger fool. But unfortunately, that I, I don't want to say that they're bad people, but you know, the, if you're giving up, well, then get the hell out of there. 
you know, if everyone's going to give up, uh, you know, I understand. I get it. It's frustrating, but you don't have to stick around. But too many of them just get along to go along. You know, they say pick your battles and they never actually pick a battle and they just go and retire. Well, you know, like I said, it, it started changing early on when I was there. Um, the Army Values Tag, they issued this to us in the late 1990s after there was some sexual assault allegations that made the news. Drill sergeants were uh, doing things to recruits and co-ed recruits and Jesse Jackson got involved. So they gave us this thing, leadership. We're supposed to carry this. I don't think they carry this anymore, but this was just the beginning. Now they've got this. This was this on a wallet card. It doesn't say competence on there. You notice that? And anyway, this was the kind of thing that sort of triggered people into realizing, hey, we got a problem with discipline. But now it doesn't seem like they're even making an effort. Now it's all about anything goes, and I mean anything. They have trans commands in the army. Not trans like the guy is trans necessarily, but they have commands that if you come in as a soldier and decide you want to be trans, there's a, a, a command set up for that that will then pay for that transition. And by the way, you will be exempt from physical fitness training and you'll be promoted along with peers. They will not hold any of that against you and they'll pay for the whole thing. So... Yeah, fine. If you want this, if this is what they want, this is the cultural change they want. They kicked out guys like Pop, okay, guys who, who fit that mold of who wants to join, and they want this instead. Okay, if that's what they want, then don't be surprised when it doesn't work. Oh, silly you, it's going to work. Well, no, it won't. You have the code of conduct and all this. Even back then, I'm an American fighting. Back then when I first joined, it was I'm an American fighting man. They got rid of that. They can't say man anymore because, I mean, well, you know, whatever. All right, so the that was an early indication, but even people who were paying more attention to it, Stephanie Gutman, she got this right. In 2000, this book came out, Kind of Gentle Military, talked all about what was happening, didn't pay attention to her. Things just kept on going that way. She concluded that more or less, it's Scotch, English, Irish descended guys, mostly from the South, okay, rednecks, who want to join these combat arms jobs. And you are opening yourself up to a volunteer military and expecting these guys to walk right in, and they're not, you know? And, this was another thing, rise of the military welfare state. Well, it sort of became, they used to call them welfare soldiers, people who just do whatever they can to get all the benefits. You know, uh, Even then, when this book came out in 2015, they didn't imagine there'd be something like a trans command that would encourage people to join, to become, to go through with their trans dreams, but that's happening. So people are joining maybe for the wrong reasons if they do it all. And then, of course, when the idea that every veteran who comes out has a disability and a high school student thinks, do I want to come out and be a disabled veteran? Now, I know that's not really a fair way of looking at it, but that's the way that someone's going to come in. And what this disability does, this, the reputation of somebody who can't take care of themselves, it doesn't just affect the perspective of a recruiter, but it starts to affect the actual guy who has the disability sometimes. They, they think like they can't do any work uh, or whatever. It's, it's really, it's not taking care of them the way we expect to take her. Here's, you know, to work for yourself or others, not at all affects the employment decisions of older veterans. You know, what, what, I'm not saying that these guys are, are doing anything dishonest or you know, not, shouldn't be taken care of, but you see where I'm going with this idea that if it's going to be all about trans and all about, oh, every veteran who comes out is disabled, and of course, every veteran who, who comes out is homeless. You can't see the word homeless anywhere these days without having veteran right behind it. 39,000 homeless veterans. Well, there's probably 39,000 homeless veterans who once had a job somewhere else too. Does that mean their prior employers are responsible for making them homeless? Does that mean the army is necessarily responsible for making them homeless? Well, no. And I'm not saying we shouldn't look into this and take care of them where we can. But again, homeless, disabled, trans, these are the words that are out there for recruiting. How are you going to attract somebody? And then, of course, the competency aspect of it, like I mentioned earlier. You know, these are just the collisions in the Navy since 89. You know, are we really, I mean, it's getting worse, it seems like. Are we, are we really generating competency? Are we able to do the job? Are we able to fight the wars that we say we want to fight? Well, that's another subject. I guess we shot down 21 drones with million-dollar missiles, but these guys are, you know, the Houthis in the desert in Yemen. They, they don't spend a lot on their drones. And then again, in March, U.S.-led coalition shoots down 15 drones. Okay, well, uh, why? I mean, if we need a military to, to do this. I mean, so mission analysis coupled with recruiting... If you want to get involved in Ukraine like they're talking about, and I seriously hope we don't, you know, they're going to need more of this and a little less of this. That's the military the public thinks it has, or at least that's what they thought they had. This is the military they actually have. And, you know, no ding on these guys and gals. Uh, you know, they were probably told, here, carry these flags, whether they believe it or not. 
That's where we're going. This is why your recruiting in an age of volunteer service has to match your needs first, who you try to recruit, and do those people want to join what you're selling? They're not buying. You can't make them buy. You want to try to draft? You want to try to draft? Okay, I'm waiting to see how that goes. Stay tuned.